On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program James Goodell. He is the author of Fighting for the Press, the Inside Story of the Pentagon Papers, and Other Battles. Welcome to the program, James. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, now, before we get into sort of the uh, some of the the things that you experienced during that time and their implications for now, but, but why why write this book? We're forty years out now from the anniversary in a couple of months, I guess, uh, from uh, the anniversary of the release of the Pentagon Papers. Um, tell us why now. Well, uh, why now? There are uh, many lessons in this book uh, for all of us, but particularly for Obama. And the principal lesson, without getting into too much detail, is uh, don't believe uh, them when they tell you it's going to damage uh, national security. And number two, if you're president of the United States, don't get tied too closely to defending national security at every turn, because it will upend you. And I would argue that uh, uh, Obama hasn't learned the lessons, and he's... Uh, all uh, bogged down with a whole series uh, of leaks, which if he'd read my book, he wouldn't be. Well, all right, let's start. Uh, when, first, who is the them when you say don't listen to them? Well, the them are, uh, I would, how do we describe it? It would be the bureaucracy, the national uh, defense establishment. Uh, the national defense establishment uh, is there before your president, and will be in office after your president. And that national defense establishment has views with respect to classification of information. And unless you listen to them carefully, they will tell you absolutely everything is classified, and any disclosure of it will damage national security. I mean, that's the lesson of the Pentagon Papers. Case after case after case are the most ridiculous examples of overclassification. What well, what do you think? I mean, what is it that drives that uh, that sort of, I guess, ongoing bureaucracy to to seek to classify more and more and more? Well, I think it's a confusion between trying to protect confidentiality of information and protecting secrecy of information. I think that all of us who have uh, organizational responsibility, or at least I did. Uh, with respect to uh, institutions, have a desire to protect confidentiality of information, and it's an appropriate desire. But it doesn't mean just because you want to protect something that's confidential that it's so secret that if someone publishes it or leaks it, they go to jail. And I don't think the them that I've talked about, the National uh, Security Establishment, can tell the difference anymore, or if they ever could, between what is confidential, which they want to keep to themselves, and what is secret, for which they seek criminal punishment. And and, and so and, and and thus, I assume is the is the lesson of the book that had um, uh, the president read uh, your book, I should say, uh, fighting for the press. Uh, the lesson that he would have learned that that key notion that the national security establishment will always project a level of, uh, of I guess, uh, almost a grandiosity in terms of their secrets as opposed to other secrets. Yeah, that's correct. They would, uh, they would say that everything is secret. I'll give you an example from my book. Um, the uh, Pentagon Papers contained speeches of uh, then of uh, uh, President Eisenhower and uh, President Kennedy, and they were classified. And the judge asked the person who was responsible for the classification, does that mean that they can't be released? Answer, no, they can't be released. They're classified. So you, you get a, a mindset uh, that lacks rationality, and it's easy to pass that on to a new boy. That's the new president. Who, and this one, uh, President Obama, has not served in the military. And I think that he's over-impressed uh, with that type of thinking. Interesting. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, 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 about your specific experience at the Times. I mean, wh when, 
uh, uh, tell us about the how you 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 first came to hear of uh, of the papers, what they represented to you, and um, uh, what you what you actually did. What was the mechanism at that point once you were made aware of them? Well, <clears throat> you got to work at a at a newspaper to appreciate the fact that when you're at a public uh, event, which I was, and uh, the managing editor or <clears throat> key editor says to you, hey, we got some classified papers, then turns on his heel and walks away to understand he's telling you, go figure out the law, which is the way it uh, happened. And I went and, and looked up the law, and you know, there wasn't any law, and there isn't any law today, even though you wouldn't know it uh, by reading the paper. It's been made up uh, over the last X uh, years. So you go up, uh, you go look up the law. I concluded the law uh, didn't exist, and that uh, uh, under the First Amendment, uh, one should be published. So that was the, the first step. And then the, the second step is clearing it with the people who own uh, the organization, the owners of the news, uh, New York Times. Uh, they're outside lawyers, and in my case, they're running up against a, a stone wall. And uh, so a part of the book is describing how I uh, moved that uh, stone wall and the uh, drama that uh, uh, resulted from it, because the uh, Pentagon Papers case, just to remind your, your viewers, was this amazing case uh, that started one day uh, and ended, one day in June and ended on uh, 17 days later uh, in, this, in the Supreme Court. So... Uh, that's about as best I can do as a short answer to which is really a long question. Well, I mean, so when you say the law, I mean, what you're talking about is any type of law that speaks to the, um, I guess, the, the liability of a uh, publishing enterprise for publishing secrets, I mean, uh, that, or, or classified yeah. documents. Yeah, that's right. So so what you do is if you're a lawyer you, and you have that sort of, little uh, nudge at a public event, you look up the law leaks. And uh, so I looked up law leaks. Well, there wasn't any, any law there that either uh, said what the liability was for the leaker or, as you point out, uh, the newspaper, or the New York Times, which is a leaky. You look up the law and then, then there was nothing there. Uh, so that really surprised me. And I began to realize it shouldn't be too much of a surprise because we do have a First Amendment in this country, which permits people to speak and write pretty much as they please. And that uh, the First Amendment got in the way of Congress passing any such a law. And so now at that point, you look up uh, the law to see what the liability is of The New York Times as a as a leaky, as you call them. Uh, and what? Between uh, that time and you begin to uh, make this case internally um, uh, as to the the right of the New York Times to publish this material, um, at, at what point did you actually see the material, A, um, and, and what impact did it have on you? Because part of what um, uh, I know is part of this story is that you... Your background was such, uh, having a background in intelligence allowed you to, s to see what this material was in terms of um, its, its potential danger to the national security of the United States. Right. Well, this material is similar to, very, uh, uh, to a lot of other uh, intelligence material. It was uh, rolled into my office in supermarket uh, baskets, you know, those things you roll on the floor. 47 volumes. Uh, I opened the first volume, and I started reading it, and I said, gee, I think I've heard this before. I flipped to the footnotes, and the material that I was reading had been published in the New York Times before, and I said, oh, zingo, because I had served for a period of time for six years in the uh, Intelligence Reserve, actually writing sort of, a, 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 what do I say, practice papers very much like the Pentagon Papers, so I knew what the mindset was. You go and look to the material that's already been published, you reform it, and then you put a classified stamp on it. It's classified. 
And I said, holy moly, I thought I was just practicing. I didn't know they really did this in real life, but there it was. The government had done just what I had done sort of as a practice reservist. So I said, oh, this is a bunch of baloney. You can't take something that's already been published, you know, re, uh, say it again your own way, and stamp, stamp classified on it. And, you know, if you want to do that, to go back to my first point, to keep things confidential, oh, be my guest. But don't think that your view of confidentiality is going to stop me from talking to someone on the radio as I am now or putting it in the newspaper. And 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 but and, and of course that wasn't I mean all of the uh, the I mean the, and we're talking thousands of pages of documents obviously but um, that was not necessarily indicative of all the information uh, in 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 the um, in the Pentagon no, papers. No, it wasn't indicative. I mean the sources of information change, but you have to start somewhere. So if you know, for example, you can reprint what you've already printed. That is to say. They say the New York Times said, stop secret, I don't care what they say, I can print that. Then you move along and you get the documents that look more like what Snowden has released. Uh, you know, uh, documents that instruct people how to do this and do that. And there the judgment becomes more uh, difficult because you have to make a common sense judgment whether the release of that information is going to damage national security. But lo and, lo and behold, and this is even true in Snowden's case, by the way, uh, when you start researching some of the documents that look scary, you find that uh, there have been books written about parts of them, so forth and so on. In Snowden's case, uh, you know, the Snowden's material had actually been released previously uh, in the New York Times, not in great detail. But the there becomes a point in which you wonder whether there are any, quotes secret secrets that are going to damage or whether we're just looking at, at, at confidentially. But uh, if your point is it gets more difficult when you stop leaving the reprinting of the New York Times, it becomes more difficult but not impossible. And so when uh, internally you um, had, had made the argument that um, – the Times within, is within its rights uh, to publish this material. It goes ahead uh, to, to begin the process of literally of actually of, of, of publishing it. By, by that, I mean uh, the presses are rolling. At that point, the Nixon administration um, uh, files an injunction. And uh, w what then became their uh, legal... Uh, I guess, charge or rationale in terms of that injunction? And, and how does that play into the Espionage Act? And was that the first time that that, that, that act had been invoked, or, or I, I, I should say, uh, within, I guess, modern, the modern era, if, if you will, uh, was that the first time that that, uh, that had been invoked? Yeah. Well, we're, we hear today about the Espionage Act and uh, we hear that Snowden uh, may be a spy and not a patriot. And the reason we hear that today was because way back then, for the very first time, the government decided to use the Espionage Act to stop a publication. And I had looked at that act and decided it didn't apply because, guess what, it applies to espionage. It doesn't apply to publishing in a newspaper. Espionage is when you go directly with the information, and you give it to the enemy with the intent to damage the United States. That's not what happens when uh, people publish. So the government used this law, which they found. I mean, it was the first time anyone had found it. Uh, it was the 1917 law, and I thought it was ridiculous. So when I saw the government coming in and using it after I had reached that earlier decision— I said, well, they're just up the, up the creek on this one. The court isn't going to uh, pay any attention to them, which was true. They, the court did not. So the issue became if there's no law, we're back to that First Amendment. So their case after they uh, were told they couldn't use the Espionage Act really became a case that says, okay, 
First Amendment says you can publish, but you can't publish material that damages national security. Yeah, that's our injunction. And that's how they got to the Supreme Court with the New York Times enjoined, by the way, and the Washington Post, which had published more or less the same time, was not. So uh, that was the issue before the Supreme Court. And that, in that case was New York Times uh, Company versus the United States. Uh, and that, that uh, it was a 6-3 decision. Just tell us, I mean, what, what, what that, uh, just characterize that decision for us and what its implications should be today, because I want to move into, uh, uh, you know, where we are today with, these, with this stuff. Okay, so what, the, uh, what the, the decision said, look, under the First Amendment, you can't come in here and ask to stop the presses, because if you stop the presses, they can't speak. The First Amendment says you can speak. There is an exception. If the material you're talking about, government, is going to really damage national security in a immediate, horrible way, we will stop the presses. But that's going to be a very rare example, and it's certainly not in the Pentagon Papers. So in the real world, the case says, the First Amendment says, you can't stop people from publishing unless you're publishing the atomic secret during Second World War, that sort of stuff. But in the real world, you've got, you got, you got to pass. Now, uh, when we think about today, we're thinking about the Internet age and material gets published quickly. So the issue becomes, can you get punishment of WikiLeaks, the New York Times, anything that's on the net after it's been published, and whether that very same First Amendment uh, protects you. And that's uh, the area that is a little unknown because the di digital age is, is so new. But you've got to realize with, with material that goes out so fast uh, digitally, you can't move to stop it very accurate, very uh, effectively the way you did uh, years ago when you just had newspapers. So the digital age has made the whole issue uh, more relevant. We get more leaks. Uh, and for me, uh, it's all very exciting because, uh, in a sense, I'm reliving uh, what's in that book uh, with everything that happens today. So, so is the bar, you know, and I guess the real crux comes down to is, you know, what constitutes really damaging information? I mean, right. genuinely damaging. Is the bar, and, and, and now it is, uh, you, you're saying essentially that technology has all but made obsolete the idea of enjoining uh, a, a publishing uh, house or entity from publishing this stuff because it happens so quickly that there's literally no time to enjoin uh, someone from publishing that. Is the bar different? I mean, is the is the um, it, it, it does the the plaintiff in, in this case obviously the United States or the prosecution in this case the United States is the bar different? from enjoining uh, a publishing uh, entity from publishing this stuff as opposed well, the bar, the, no the bar may be uh, a little easier to jump uh, but uh, y your listeners all know uh, from grade school high school so forth that there is a test called clear and present danger if the publication causes a clear and present danger to the national security of the United States then uh, depending on the circumstances, the government could come in and say, okay, you're going to go to jail. So, for example, if you look at Snowden and ask about all his publications with respect to the uh, telephone metadata program and so forth and so on, uh, what your listeners ought to do is, well, did the publication of that uh, damage immediate, uh, was, uh, constitute a clear and present danger to United States. And I think that uh, the president has concluded that it didn't, or else he wouldn't be asking for a debate on uh, whether we should be doing it or not. But that's, that's what the bar is, to answer your question, today. And, and so let me ask you this. I mean, based upon how aggressive, and I want to talk about the, sort of the recent history of how aggressive uh, the uh, Obama administration has been, whether it's um, 
uh, in its use of the Espionage Act. If you were to receive those Pentagon Papers today, and you were, um, you know, I guess uh, at the time it was, you, you went into uh, uh, the law books. I don't know if uh, uh, LexisNexis was not around at that time. Um, but uh, if you were to go and look at the um, uh, whether or not there was liability implications for the uh, New York Times today, based upon the recent history of the use of the Espionage Act, w would your assessment be the same? Well, I think you'd have to have a little more courage uh, than you had before, because, uh, as you imply, uh, the Obama administration has been using uh, the Espionage Act, uh, in, in my view, at a drop of a hat, which is to say that uh, they've used the Espionage uh, uh, six times to indict leakers and uh, a seventh time to charge one. That would be uh, Snowden. Now, that's not charging, as I say, Leakey, the, the publisher, but uh, you would be sitting there today with the Pentagon Papers knowing that the government thought it had a real live uh, law, uh, the Espionage Act, even though, as I told your listeners earlier, the law had dropped out of the Pentagon Papers case. After that, uh, the previous administrations tried to use it three times against leakers, and Obama seven, as I've said. So you're going to ask yourself, well, gee, it's being used against leakers. I wonder if it can be used against publishers, leakies. And uh, Obama uh, doesn't give me any confidence that he's not going to do it. Uh, there is this case instance, which perhaps we all remember, of a, a Fox News, mm -hmm. Mr. Rosen. James Rosen. And James Rosen. And in that case, the Justice Department, which is Obama's apartment, went in and told the court that Rosen, who is a leaky, who is a leaky of a leak from a, a gentleman who was telling him about Korea, uh, was a co-conspirator with a person who leaked. Now, that may sound like fancy language, but you're asking me, if I'm sitting there looking at the papers today, would I be concerned about what Obama's been doing? Yes, he's been using it against leakers, and he did use it against uh, poor, Mr. poor Mr. Rosen, and I have no confidence that he's not going to use it against uh, WikiLeaks or any of these new kind of uh, digital publications. So I think the decision would be harder. And, and when you look at the um, uh, the trial of uh, of Bradley Manning and the uh, the 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 government's argument that it would have made no difference if Manning had uh, provided this information directly to the New York Times or any other publication, uh, you know that we consider to be traditional traditional media, as opposed to WikiLeaks, um, in terms of their uh, theory that uh, Manning uh, was guilty under the Espionage Act. Um, w w where does that rest? In other words, when you're assessing, if you're that attorney today inside the New York Times and you're assessing the risk to the New York Times, when you look at the cases of, of James Rosen, when you look at the uh, subpoenaing, the secret subpoenaing of the um, the AP, um, uh, the AP records. When you see uh, uh, that James Risen has been uh, compelled to testify, uh, or, or you know the the attempt is to c compel him to testify. Uh, when you see the ongoing um, uh, a grand jury, which we believe we have every reason to believe is c continuing uh, to seek an indictment against uh, Julian Assange. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the theory um, uh, propagated by the government in the Amani case. Of those different instances, what is the most alarming to you? In other words, what is the hierarchy? Is, is something being built here that leads to um, a, a, uh, a theory that the leaky is, um, is legally culpable? Well, I think that uh, where we're headed, I don't want to confuse the issue by talking about Great Britain, but Great Britain has an official secrets act, which means the leaker and leaky can be both thrown in the jug. 
And I think uh, you asked what's being built here. Uh, what is being built, in my judgment, is something very much like uh, what they're going to have in England. And uh, if you look at Manning, Manning was uh, thought to have uh, uh, been subject to trial as a traitor. Uh, that, that dropped. Uh, we look at uh, Ryzen, who must be distinguished from a Rosen. It's like a Shakespeare play, isn't it? <laughs> uh, anyway, he uh, uh, has now been uh, uh, compared to a person who witnesses a crime any time he talks to someone with uh, classified information. And as lastly, we look at the grand jury, which is sitting there to pounce on Julian Assange, should he ever come to this country he added it all up, and the pincer is closing. And I think that the bottom line is going to be, unless we fight like hell, and my book is called Fighting for the Press, uh, we're going to end up with a government that's going to be able to control its information in a criminal way, uh, in a fashion that was absolutely thought unthinkable when I first looked at those Pentagon papers X years ago. It's interesting that you mentioned the UK's official secret act because in the Atlantic uh, Monthly, Amadi uh, Etzioni, who is a um, who served as an advisor to the Carter White House and uh, uh, is supposedly um, at least um, somewhat unofficially advising uh, the Obama uh, White House, uh, made a case for um, uh, for actually more. I guess intimidation of whistleblowers in some respect, and one of the, the the his key arguments is that why should we trust the media uh, to make this determination about clear and present danger uh, as opposed to the uh, the the government? I mean, uh, he also makes the point, which is you know sort of in, in your instance uh, not terribly applicable, but he says, uh, and one in the other corner, this is. Uh, you know, squaring off between government and the media is a person who likely never served in the armed forces, has no training in assessing the limited intelligence material, whichever comes his way. You, of course, uh, did have that that type of training, but there is a good argument that uh, there are less people like um, uh, like James Goodell who are in these um, uh, these media outlets. On some level, I think that probably intimidates people in these media outlets, but, but give me your response to that notion, that we should be trusting well, the... In, in part, uh, I mean, he's, it's, someone who argues that point of view who's in government always has an upper hand because they know things you don't know. But it goes to the nature of, of intelligence, and the public has been bollocked by this nat- notion uh, forever. But intelligence uh, that we're talking about is not the disclosure of a spy in Iraq. Uh, uh, It's not the disclosure of an atomic bomb secret in the ordinary course. If it's really secret, I would suggest it doesn't get leaked. What we're talking about is information that's been collected from publications and observations that are public. And if such information... Uh, is uh, collected in that fashion, when it comes back to you with a classified stamp on it, uh, surely uh, you can sit there as a common-sense person and make some uh, judgment as to whether that type of information constitutes a clear and present danger. And in any event, you should have the right to test it out. It's not as though you want to stop somebody from... uh, publishing it to begin with, which was the what the Pentagon Papers case is all right. You know, you got a First Amendment right to get the stuff out. And, as the implication is in the article of which you speak, you do it wrong because you don't know enough, well, you're going to be up the uh, creek. And uh, your case will then be used for other cases. But there never have been any such cases. So I would argue that um, the claims that are made for national security, the expertise that goes along uh, with them um, is highly overstated. Give me your assessment. I mean, uh, in the past couple of weeks, we had a um, 
uh, a report that was uh, from various media outlets, including, I think, McClatchy, Washington Post, uh, about uh, uh, that triggered the closing of the embassies. There was clearly leaks, uh, some in the United States and some coming out of Yemen, regarding the intelligence, uh, the means in which we gathered the intelligence that, that caused the embassy leaks across the, across the world. Twenty embassies, uh, all of which have been reopened short of uh, the one in Yemen, as far as I know. And one of the stories that came out of that was that the New York Times had this information. They had it on a Sunday. They were asked by the government not to print this, uh, but in fact, the information was then printed uh, the next day, I think, by McClatchy in the Washington Post from what appears to be two different sources. Um, wh give me your assessment as to, one, um, where the New York Times is in, in how aggressive they are in, in, in printing this stuff, and two, uh, if you think that there has been a chilling effect uh, or, 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 or what the danger is for a chilling effect in, in regarding to uh, media outlets reporting on this stuff? Well, uh, on the first one, uh, the, the facts are hard to define, uh, particularly, but uh, I am so cynical uh, that I am very uh, doubtful that everything that the government said about the Yemen situation, which led to the closing of the embassies, was in fact as uh, dangerous uh, as it uh, said. It ultimately disclosed the method of the intelligence, which was the interception of a phone call from Zawiri to a Yemen reader, a leader rather. Uh, the government never discloses its method. I, I only can think that uh, cynically it disclosed the method to uh, emphasize this case, how clear the case was, but at the same time, you don't do it that way, and I wonder if they ever had had a case. And that's what the sort of analysis I think you you have to make uh, when you get that information, which was your 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 first question. Uh, the second question is, uh, what impact does all of the above have on the uh, ability to cover this information in the first place? And is there a, ch a chilling effect? I think that the, the, the more the government makes it uh, look uh, criminal uh, to uh, uh, cover and publish this information, makes it criminal in the case of James Risen uh, to uh, talk to somebody who is, uh, uh, has access to classified information, uh, treats Rosen as a co-conspirator, uh, chases, uh, WikiLeaks, uh, I think that is a chilling effect and in the real world is not going to encourage reporters of whom we have very few, to tell the truth, who cover national security to go out and, and cover it. Why the hell they want to, why do they want to do that? They're going to be called criminals, uh, they're going to be harassed, and God knows how much uh, information the government's going to get from their Internet, I think I'd choose another line of work. So if we don't have enough reporters who cover this stuff, uh, it, it perforce means that uh, it's, it's, it's all been chilled because there's no way to get the stuff out. Specifically, I mean, let me ask you about the New York Times decision not to publish that. I mean, do you perceive the Times, um, where do you rate them relative to um, how uh, bold they were in, um, in, in reporting on the Pentagon Papers. In other words, um, why is it that the Times would have held that back but McClatchy wouldn't? Is that indicative of something that we should be concerned about? Well, I, I think that it would be a mistake to assume that newspapers or publications for journalists uh, report and publish on everything they have because they edit out, must edit out stuff all the Time and before the Pentagon Papers, the Times had uh, not published uh, stories, and the general reason for so doing was the determination that they constituted a clear and present danger. So uh, I think that that judgment uh, is made uh, from editor to editor uh, through the course of time, and each editor is going to look at it uh, somewhat uh, differently. But I think that. Implicitly, they have a bar in the mind, and uh, 
will, uh, you know, decide not to publish if they think that under particular circumstance it's going to damage uh, a particular operation or or whatever. So do, I do can't you think, make any let conclusions. Me, let me, is that the only calculus? I mean, in other words, is it is, well, is there another yeah, calculus know. that perhaps um, we the 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 risk in publishing this is not simply that it may or may not be a clear and present danger to the United States, but it's also that it may implicate our access and our relationship with a given administration so that we wouldn't have access to other stories that we might have access to. In other words, yeah. we'll trade yeah, off it. this, uh, you know, we'll let McClatchy scoop us on this one so that we have access to other stories down the road. Well, you know, I, I've never understood how reporters like you do your job because every time I try to do it I find it impossible. I mean, how do you how do you on the one hand attack the hell out of somebody and on the uh, other hand uh, uh cozy up to that person to cause a leak say for example. So if you're asking me in the real world would uh, a newspaper would uh, the New York Times for example put off publication uh of a particular matter because it would destroy their relationship with the sources I mean, I like to think that never happens, but uh, reporters are human beings, so I suppose it enters into the calculation. Well, I should just say, for uh, for clarification's sake, that nobody tells me anything. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm, <laughs> sadly, I'm not very cozy with anybody, so it's it's less of a uh, a difficult calculation for me to make. Um, but um, uh, James Goodell, uh, the the uh, the the book is fighting for the press. We will put a link up at uh, Majority FM. Uh, the inside story of the Pentagon Papers and other battles. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it.